Well, hello and welcome to another show and episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, your host and the Private Money Authority. Welcome you to another show here. And I got to tell you, we have got a movement going on. We're almost at 200,000 downloads and listens, and we're just excited to have you here. If this is your first time to the show, I want to give you a very, very special welcome. Here on the show, we talk about all things real estate investing, from single family houses to commercial to land. And even today, we're going to be talking about self storage and how you can really automate this business and truly enjoy passive income in this world of real estate investing. If you've been tuning in over the past months, you know I have amazing experts and guests come here on the show, and today is no different. But before I bring on my friend and business colleague, I've got a free gift for everybody that's tuning in. You know, I'm known as the Private Money Authority, and the reason I am is because over 10 years ago, I was cut off from the banks with no notice, no way to fund my deals, and I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money, which has got nothing to do with mortgage uh, lenders, institutions, or hard money lenders. This is private money where we actually do business with individuals. So I've got an on-demand webinar ready for you to discover the five easy steps from going from no funding to over $2 million in funding right away, just like I did. So check it out right after the show. You can get right on over to www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast and check out that on-demand webinar. That's www.jayconner.com dot com forward slash money podcast. Well, today I'm so excited to have my friend and business colleague, Mr. Fernando Angelucci here on the show with me. And before I bring on Fernando, let me tell you just a little bit about him. First of all, he's way too young to be this successful. He is a 28 year old senior managing partner of what's called the Titan Wealth Group based out of Chicago, Illinois. Now, Fernando, he first read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, when he was only 16 years old. And shortly after that, Fernando started up his first business when he was only 19 years old, while he was still at the University of Illinois. Well, when Fernando graduated and got his degree for, as in uh, ag bioengineering back in 2013, he quickly went on to work for a Fortune 50 company. And while there, he started immediately investing in single-family houses. So by the age of a ripe, young, 23 years old, he was able to replace his income. And he exited the nine-to-five rat race and began investing in single-family and multifamily properties full-time. So by the age he was only 24, he began purchasing self-storage facilities. And within two years, he started pooling funds from his investors to be able to ground up class A self-storage facilities. So today, folks, we're talking about self-storage, and welcome to the show, Fernando. How in the world are you doing, Fernando? Hey, Jay, I'm doing well. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic, man, fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to come here and be on the show with us today. So Ooh. it's good to see you. We were just together at our... Um, Collective Genius Mastermind meeting a few weeks ago. Let's see, where were we? Down in Florida, I think we were together uh, for, for that mastermind. So, Fernando, I'm excited. I'm, I mean, I've only had one other guest uh, since we started up the show to talk about self-storage. So there's, there's not many of you guys out there that are like in it full time like you are. So let's jump right on into self-storage. But first of all, Fernando, before we do, tell my audience why it is that you're qualified to talk about self-storage. Yeah, we're full-time self-storage investors. We're buying a new self-storage facility every 60 to 90 days right now. It's starting to trend toward every 30 to 60 days. Um, and we're placing almost 100% leverage on a lot of our properties because of the very uh, high appraisals that we're getting uh, versus what the purchase prices are. We just started uh, getting a lot of syndicated money following us. Uh, we haven't had to use it just yet. 
but yeah, everything's been going real well. We'd like to get to a point in the next 34 months, 35 months. We'd like to be at about a $60 million valuation on the company. So we're starting to trend in the right direction here. Wow. So you've been doing this now for four years. How long have you been like totally focused full time on self storage? About a year now. So I kind of step back and give you my history. So I first started out in the single family space as a wholesaler. Very quickly, I graduated up to my first multifamily building as a buy and hold investment. It was a five unit apartment building. And then I started to get all the type of issues that come along with being a landlord, that 1 a.m. calls because the toilet's running, you know, the evictions and the people not wanting to pay. And it started to really bear down to me when I was looking at it. It didn't make a lot of sense long term for me. I'm more of a lifestyle investor. I want to invest not to be the richest guy out there, but just to have a really good life and have enough time to spend with my friends and family. So I started looking towards uh, different avenues. And I was down in uh, Indianapolis for a real estate expo. And that's when I met a mutual friend of ours, Scott Myers. And uh, he basically showed me, showed me the way. <laughs> right. Yep. So from there, I started doing what I knew how to do. And that was putting self-storage facilities under contract and actually wholesaling them for much larger spreads than I was making in the single family and the small multifamily space. An opportunity came where a few of my old cash buyers that I worked with and good friends, they actually approached me and said, Hey, we like what you're doing with the self-storage thing. We'd like to you know, build a company with you. We have a lot of cap already at our disposable. You know, how would you like to do this full time and, and kind of, you know, slow down the wholesaling side of things and, and your multifamily, single family side? I said, absolutely. So uh, for the first two years, it was a lot of wholesale and self-storage facilities. And then once I uh, got together with Guy, Ron and Steven, then we started doing this full time and, and actually acquiring to hold long term 15 plus years on each on each facility is the goal. I got you. So how many different projects or self-storage projects or you know you got you talk about single family houses what do you call the self storage is it a location is it a project yeah. what is it's it a facility is what i like to call a facility i got yeah. you how many, how many facilities are you involved in now yeah we're up to six right now we have another three under contract and then we have about 12 in the pipeline um, that are still being underwritten at the moment wow wow so when it comes to funding these deals what percentage would you say are requiring for you to raise the capital and what percentage will the current owners actually sell or finance and carry the note? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. We've had a, a hodgepodge of, of different setups to these deals. We bought some deals cash just because we had to, had to move very, very quickly. Other deals, we were able to structure a hundred percent financing from the banks. So the banks, actually paid us. We closed a deal a couple of weeks ago in, in Hampton, Tennessee, that we walked away from the closing table with a $96,000 check. And uh, we're working on one right now in Little Rock, Arkansas, where the bank is going to come in in a first position at $550,000. And then the seller is going to carry back a second position for $200,000 at 0% interest for five years. So it's a, it's a nice. mix of cash, seller finance. We always like to lean towards the seller finance because then we get to dictate the terms and you know really make sure that it works for us long term. You just gave an example of what I do all the time. Like tomorrow, I'm closing on a deal. It's a single family house, big project over on the beach, but I'm buying the house and I'm coming home with like a 60 or $70,000 check. You know, there I mean, I like to get, I, I like to get hear. paid. I like to get paid, you know, to buy properties. So that's pretty cool. So how do you find these deals, Fernando? I mean, where do you go? I mean, you're buying, you know, all over the place. Right. Yeah. So we're currently buying in 24 states. The number one part of our marketing campaign always comes from what we know best, and that's direct to seller marketing. We will go ahead and, and send our criteria over to one of our data analysts he'll put together a list of properties that meet those criteria. And primarily right now, our criteria are, has to be a mom and pop owner. So they can't be one of these large sophisticated REITs that's never going to sell to a 
you know, sell to us at the prices that we need. They need to be in markets that are either in the Midwest or if they're outside of the Midwest, they're low property tax states because that's, uh, as you'll see later on, it's one of the largest line item expenses we have here. And then, like I said, it needs to be a mom and pop owner. So when I, when I mean mom and pop, what I mean is someone that's not a sophisticated you know, investor, they usually are running these facilities as a secondary source of income. They don't have a lot of management efficiencies in place, and there's still an opportunity to bring these facilities to their highest and best use. I got you. Now, when you say you send your criteria over to a data analyst, is that the same thing as a broker? Correct. Right. So we use a brokerage company based out of Chicago and they kind of have both sides. So I say, here's what I want. And then they will always come back and say, well, I think maybe if we approach it slightly differently, you'll still get the same results that you're looking for. So instead of me just buying a list and telling them what I want, I usually rely on their expertise as as a data analyst and a data broker to tell me, here's what you really want, Fernando, based on what you're telling me. Here's the list that we can provide. So what kind of criteria are you sending to your brokers these days as to what you're looking for? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty easy. So I, I give them the list of states that I'm looking to invest in, and then I have them scrub out the top 100 operators in the business to get rid of all the really good professional players. I also have them scrub out the top 50 management companies. And what you'll find a lot of the time is that there's a lot of these, these facility owners that they don't want to do the management themselves, so they'll hire these you know, very efficient, very professional companies to manage their facilities for them. And as a part of that, one of the things they do is they recommend to their owners, you know, what prices to list or sell their properties at. Right now, the self-storage market, there's a lot of deals that are moving at four and a half to six and a half, maybe seven and a half percent cap rates. Right now on our portfolio, we're averaging about 11.2% cap rate on the day one purchase. So I'm trying to almost double the market here as far as the cap rates go. So let's uh, simplify that a little bit. You talk about an 11 point something cap rate, a 6 point something cap rate. What does that mean to the non-sophisticated and commercial yeah. investor so far? Yeah. So it's just a percent return on your on the money invested. So if I buy a facility and after all expenses, it produces $6,000 a year and I paid $100,000 for that facility, that's a 6% cap rate. There you go. Right. There you go. Excellent. So how do you how do you decide on which states that you want to be investing in? Is that because of the tax rates? Correct. So that's one of the two portions. The first is we like to buy in the Midwest because there's a lot of value in the Midwest when it comes to commercial property. As soon as you start hitting the East and West Coast, you have a lot of hedge fund money, a lot of international money that you're competing against. And to them, they, they just want to beat inflation. So they're willing to pay much higher prices than what we're willing to pay. So that's one of the reasons we love the Midwest. Plus, I live in Chicago, so I can get anywhere in the Midwest within a couple hours jumping on a flight. So it's easier to touch all my facilities. The second criteria is like you said, is the tax rate. Self-storage is one of those businesses where the amount of expenses, your highest expense on average is either gonna be personnel or property taxes, depending on which states you're in. So I'm trying to lower those as fast as I can. Property taxes, the easiest way is just to buy in states that have low property taxes and then contest them when you do buy property saying, hey, I think you're taxing us too much. And then the second being personnel, we try to automate a lot of our facilities as much as possible, allowing people to rent online, rent through their phone, buy tenant insurance, buy locks using little kiosks that almost look like ATMs outside the facility. So I won't need a full-time person there at, you know, costing whatever it would be for their annual salary. So when you have a, or so your broker, let's say, has found you a prospective facility to invest in, I would imagine that, you know, you want to know what the performance of that facility has been. You'd want to know what the books look like. You would want Correct. to know what the current vacancy rate is, uh, you know, how many vacant, you know, so when you're, when you're negotiating with the seller of a self-storage facility, 
how do you know you're getting truthful answers as to what the current and past performance of that facility has been? Correct. So we'll always request a profit and loss statement over the last 12 months trailing. Now, what that means is that a trailing 12 month PL is it shows what my income and expenses are by the month. So I can see trends in the income coming in and the expenses going out. Another thing that we'll do is once we get to the point where we will put together a purchase agreement that's signed by both of the parties, one of the due diligence items that must be submitted for us to close on the property is the last three years of tax returns. Uh -huh. so I'll take you on your word for the P&Ls. You know, there's always ways to, to fudge those numbers, but you really can't hide once I get tax returns, you know, and, and as real estate investors, you know, we like to maybe not show as much income on our tax returns and maybe pump up the expenses a little bit more. And that actually works in my favor as a buyer and say, Hey, well, you know, you said your facility produces $150,000 a year in gross profit, but your tax returns say 90,000. Where's that 60,000? Oh, you know, well, I got people pay me in cash. And I said, okay, that's fine. You know, I totally understand. I'd like to see, you know, checking accounts where you show those deposits. Where's the cash going? I want to see that. Right, right. And then what about current vacancy as far as, you know, vacancy rates? How do you, how do you know what that is? Correct. So we will request a rent roll and a schedule of rents, and that should tell us which units are rented and which units are vacant and what they're paying per unit. But you can't, again, you can never trust those numbers, right? So then what we physically do is we'll go and walk the property. I'll go and I'll walk, I'll count locks. <laughs> Each locker I'll see, is that a manager's lock? Is that a user, a tenant's lock? And I'll physically count them and then I'll compare that against our rent roll and schedule of rents to see if they're telling the truth. Oh, you know, I only have 10% vacancy. It's like, oh, is that right? Well, when I, you know, secret shopped your facility the other week, I saw 40% of the locks there were manager locks. So what's that all about? Are you renting all of them? You know, I don't see that here. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So, you know, when we think about self-storage in contrast to investing in single-family houses, single-family houses can be a short-term play where you wholesale a house and you assign it to you know another real estate investor. A single-family house can be a fix and a flip. A single-family house can be a buy and a hold. So there's all these different kinds of strategies with single-family houses. How about speaking to other different strategies, exit strategies on self-storage? Absolutely. So the way I got started in the self-storage game was by wholesaling deals, you know, but instead of me making six or 10 grand a pop, I'm making 60 to 100,000 per contract assigned. So that's, you know, 10 to 15 houses right there with marginally more work, not much, maybe an extra 10 or 20% more work on the due diligence, right? Okay, so on a wholesale deal, on a self-storage, you can make 60, 70, 80, $100,000 mm -hmm. on just a wholesale assignment fee. Correct, yeah, we actually have one scheduled for later this month where I believe our net assignment fee will be 96 or $97,000 on that property. And that's just for uh, just pushing paper and negotiating. That's it. That's pushing paper. All right. Now, I know how you build a buyer's list for single family houses and real estate investors. How in the world do you find the buyer's list for self storage facilities? So, I have a few different ways of building my buyer's list. Number one is to go to all the self storage network events that are out there, specifically when you're working on a national basis like we are, going to the large conferences. So, there's the Inside Self Storage Conference, there's the Self Storage Association Conference. These are national organizations, you know, going out there and rubbing shoulders. You can also go to your local self storage facility association. So, for example, I'm in Illinois. We're a part of the Illinois Self Storage Association. We join the local state chapter for every state that we buy a facility in, and that increases our buyers list. Another thing that we also do is, you know, there's a lot of self storage brokers out there and they love to you know get anybody they can on their buyer list and then push out the deals that they're trying to sell at these ridiculously low cap rates you know what i do i save those emails and then i send it to my virtual assistant maybe four or five months later and say hey go find out who bought this facility and then i send them a letter saying hey 
If you thought that facility you bought for four and a half percent cap rate was good, check out mine at 10%. I think you'd like it. Nice. Yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. So, so as it relates to this world of self storage, is, is there such a thing as like, like a turnaround? So, so for example, like a know, flip? It's, it's, it's real popular in apartments to where you can, you, you know, you, you invest in a distressed or rundown apartment complex, you get it fixed up, uh, you get better tenants, you raise the rents, and then you sell it. Is that somewhat similar to what you could do in self-storage? Yeah, and there's actually a secondary option that you have because it is a commercial property. So one thing that we do is we'll buy a facility that's underperforming, we'll, you know, get rid of all the all the troublemakers, if you will. We'll increase rents as we do any type of capital expenditures to the building, make it look nicer, make it look safer. We'll decrease expenses by putting in management efficiencies. And then we'll turn around and we'll either list it for sale, which is the same way that you can do for single family and multifamily. But what I like to do is then go and put it on the uh, commercial mortgage market. So either commercial backed securities, mortgage securities, life insurance companies love to finance these. Same thing with agency debt, the Freddie, the Fannie Mac, stuff like that. And then just pull all my money out of the deal. So I, I now have infinite cash on cash return. I already have all my money back to go do it again. I, I just, I can recycle that same million dollars over and over and over again. And every time I do it, I add another nine, $10,000 a month in passive income to my portfolio. Got you. So for the sake of our audience, how about go ahead and list the benefits, Fernando, as to why self-storage, why be interested and invest and do this self-storage business, say, as opposed to other types of real estate? Sure. So let's look at some historical data. So number one, it is the highest return versus any other real estate asset class. So looking at a study that was done by the National Association of REITs, between 1994 and 2017, the average annual return, if you would have put money in the S&P 500 in the stock market, was about 7.54%. If you put that same money into self-storage, your average annual return would have been 17.43%. Right? Wow. So that's a huge difference, 10%, but we're all real estate investors here. So it's not about stocks or self-storage, it's about residential and multifamily. So in that same time, remember, self-storage is 17.43% average annual return. During that same time, residential properties returned 13.42% and multifamily returned 13.32%. So that 4% difference, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add compounding interest in, it's a huge difference. So let's, let's say that you, Jay, you have $100,000. It's 1994, you have $100,000. You're trying to, where, where should you put it? So if you put into the S&P 500, that 100,000 would be $532,000 in 2017. If you put it into residential properties, that 100,000 would be 1.8 million. But if you put that 100,000 into self-storage, that 4% compounding extra interest, that 100,000 would be worth $4.02 million in 2017. Wow. So almost doubling your money. Wow, awesome. So, yeah. So when you're analyzing a deal, just give us the 30,000 foot view. I mean, keep yeah. it simple. What are the main criteria points to consider when analyzing a deal as to whether it is a deal? Yeah. And believe it or not, the last thing I look at are the financials. The very first thing I look at is the market. Is the market oversupplied? Is it undersupplied? So what I'll do is I'll just go look at what type of competitors do I have in my space? Are they at 100% occupancy? That's a good sign for me. If they're all at 50% occupancy, that's telling me that there's already too much self storage in that market, and I'll just stop my underwriting right there. Now, how do you get that information so quickly on, you know, on occupancy? Yeah, very easy. So what we'll do is I'll go ahead and a lot of these things I have created standard procedures for our virtual assistants to do for us. So the very first thing I do is we'll go do a market study We'll identify who our competitors are in that space, and then we'll actually secret shop them. We'll, we'll call them and say, hey, 
you know, what type of occupancy do you have? Half the time they tell us, half the time they won't tell us. If they won't tell us, then we'll call back from a different number and we'll say, hey, we're a large contractor moving into town. We need a bunch of units while we wait and try to find a warehouse. How many units do you have available or how much square feet do you have available for us to potentially use? And that's another way to get those numbers from them, right? At the same time, we'll also ask what their pricing is for each one of the different size units. And that will allow us to see, are they full because they're undercutting the market a lot or are they very empty because they're charging a 20 or 30% premium to the market? These are all things that we look at. If that passes that sniff test, then we move on to the next underwriting criteria, which is called the supply index number. Supply index number is a fancy way to say, how much square feet of self storage is there per person in this market? On average, 7.25 square feet per person. That's considered roughly stable. If there's enough supply to meet the demand in the market. So if all of a sudden I'm, I'm running my numbers and I see that there's a market that has three square feet per person on average, that means that I can come into that market and double the total amount of self storage and still not meet all that demand. I love very low supply index numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's on the opposite side, then again, we cut it off. We say, all right, we're done underwriting this. Let's move on to the next deal. If all those things meet the criteria, then I start looking into the financials and I say, okay, how much money are you producing? What is the expenses going out? What's your purchase price? Is it at a cap rate that makes sense for me? More importantly, is it at a cash on cash return requirement that makes sense for me? A lot of my facilities, I'm looking to double my money in the facility every year. So that means that I'm looking for a 50% or higher cash on cash return. Got you. So if someone has never been involved in self-storage, but they're interested in getting started, you know, from your own experience, what's your recommendation on how someone could get started in self-storage? Yeah, I have a, a couple of recommendations. One thing is they can always contact me. You know, I usually give out my cell phone number on these podcasts it's, and I will, I'll do it right now. It's 630-408-8090. Texting is preferred. You can also go to our website, titanwealthgroup.com. Another great asset is, is uh, Bigger Pockets. There's a lot of self-storage investors on biggerpockets.com that are more than willing to help out. I'm always on there. Our, our communal friend, Scott Myers, uh, he's always on bigger pockets and he's answering anybody's questions that they have about self-storage. But in addition to that, Scott also offers a boot camp where he'll teach you how to get up and running in 90 days on self-storage investing. And that's actually what I did to, you know, to, to get in the game. And I, I really recommend it. Scott's a good friend of mine and he's changed my life. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So give out your uh, cell phone number one more time. Uh, for sure. That. That's, that's very kind of you to offer of your cell phone. I guess people can reach out to you and uh, ask you questions and dig a little bit deeper if they want to get started, right? Absolutely. So my number is 630-408-8090. Awesome. In fact, we'll just go ahead and just put that right up. It'll be in the, <laughs> it'll be in the show notes and you know, if, if someone happens to be watching one of our video channels right here, uh, area code for Fernando, we'll put his name up here as well, Fernando Angelucci, right? Angelucci. Yeah. So area code 630-408-8090. All right, Fernando, parting comments. Hey, it Self-storage seems like it is, it's one of those things that you have to wait to get into. You have to, you know, a lot of investors I talk to say, oh, first I'm going to do some single family, then I'm going to do some small multifamily, then maybe some big multifamily, then, then in 10, 15 years, I'll do self-storage. You don't need to do that. It's easier than multifamily. It's easier than single family. It's easier to manage them. Just get started right away. And if you need the money, call Jay. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Fernando, thank you so much for taking the time to join uh, join me and be here on the show. Likewise. Thanks so much, Jay. All right, folks. There you have it. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here with this show is taking your business to the next level. We'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.